um, I want to turn our attention to actual victims. Um, there was a really terrible case over the past two weeks out of Idaho. And Brad, it's not been getting that much attention when I brought it up to you for the show. You actually said you have not heard about the killing of four students in, in Idaho as of as of this today, basically. You've not yeah, heard. I mean, I read up on it before this podcast because you alerted me to this story. But I was shocked that something so crazy and so heinous could have happened and as much of a news junkie and political junkie as I am, I hadn't heard about this story. I know it's been covered in some places, but it's gotten a tiny fraction of the coverage of something like the Club Q shooting, even though a similar amount of people died. And I think the more that I think about it, I think that's because this doesn't really serve a political agenda. It's a terrible tragedy with some really alarming twists and turns, but there's no cl clear political agenda, so it's just fallen under the radar but why don't you walk me and, and listeners who maybe this is the first time they're encountering this walk walk us through what happened and and what we know yeah i think you're exactly right and as i discuss some of the details i think listeners will probably agree with you that the reasons we're not hearing about this at, at least not at the scale that we would hear about other similar um, tragedies uh, it has a lot to do with who the victims are and the weapons that were used and things of that nature so uh, in Idaho, in a town called Moscow, which has been a little bit confusing reading up on it, um, but it's Moscow, Idaho, there was a house, an off-campus home, that six students were sharing. They were all involved in Greek life uh, and, and various sororities, and they were good friends. And um, I, we have some images that I'm going to put up on the screen for our video. Guys, if you want to check out the video you're listening on audio, I'll try to do my best to describe what some of this looks like because it's relevant to the story. But they live in this house that's three stories. And um, basically, it's, it's going to sound weird when I tell you the details, but when you look at how the house is laid out, you're going to understand a little bit better. But essentially what happened is four students um, were murdered on a Saturday evening in the middle of the night. They were killed by a knife. And we don't really know a whole lot else, which is what is making this such a like big deal in the town and why so many people are following it closely because there's just a lot of, of really weird things about this case that don't quite add up. But what we do know is that uh, the victims were three of the women who lived in the home and one of their boyfriends who was staying the night. And they were in various rooms between the second and third floors of this house. They have not said who was in what room. They've not said who was killed first. So we don't really know a lot of these details. Cops have been very, very guarded about releasing even what would seem to be like very mundane information about this. There were also two other roommates who were home that evening um, and slept through the attack and were not harmed. They were on the first floor. So when you hear that, you're like, how did, how did this happen? But if you look at the house, which we'll flash on screen now, it's kind of a split complex. You have what is the first story that has its own entrance where people would park. And it's kind of like a separate house almost. And then up on the hill, sort of uh, tacked onto it almost, is another entrance on the other side that has like a patio. And that's the second floor. And then you would go up to the third floor from there. And so apparently the house initially was built as a first story house and they added on this other side to it later on, which is why it's such a strange construction. Um, so it, it kind of makes sense how if, if the intruder had approached it from this backside where the patio is, they might have entered through the second floor um, sliding glass door there and just gone upstairs and not realized there was another floor or thought it was a basement or something like that. But imagine way, how horrifying it must be to be the people who were in the other part of the house and woke up like everything is normal. Yes. I know, I know. Well, so, and this is what else is also weird. So what we know is that the two women who were on the first floor, they woke up, they slept through the attack. We know that all of the roommates, um, those first two roommates that lived, they got home around 1 a.m. Saturday night, college town. They're all out, you know, partying and doing their own thing. Those two women get home around 1 a.m. Uh, the girl who was killed with her boyfriend, um, she and he were at a frat party. They get home around 1.45 p.m. And then the two other women who were murdered were very good friends, um, Kaylee and Maddie. And they had been out at a local bar just a couple miles from the house. Um, there's One of their sisters actually uncovered video of some of their last moments. They had stopped by a food truck and gotten some food to go and then jumped in an Uber and went home. And it's it said the timeline says that all of them are in the house by 1.45 um, the two women, Kaylee and Maddie, placed some phone calls to Maddie's ex-boyfriend between, uh, I think, 2.30 and 2.50. Like, they call him, like, seven times. And her family said that's not odd that, like, she often would just, like, I think, drunk dial people basically over and over. <laughs> and they were, they were still on very good terms. Their family was, like, they were going to get back together. Like, he was the love of her life. Like, this isn't weird at all. He's been cleared 
Um, and so they think the murders happened somewhere between 3 and 6 a.m. in the morning, but they were not reported until noon. So what happened is the two women wake up. Um, the, the 911 call has not been released. They have not said who placed the 911 call. All they have said is the 911 call came from one of the roommate's phones who lived, um, but that the person on there was another friend. They apparently woke up um, and thought that there was a unresponsive person which is just a bizarre detail. We don't know, like, did the, did the intruder lock the door so they couldn't... Because apparently cops are saying this is one of those gruesome crime scenes they've ever seen. They, this is horrible to say, but, um, but there's literally images of blood dripping down the outside of the house because it saw, was that oh. bad of a crime scene. So I don't know how those two women would wake up and just think somebody was unresponsive. Um, my sister actually had a good theory on this, which is that maybe they woke up, saw what had happened, ran out, and they passed out, and then somebody used their phone to call the police, which would kind of make more sense. Um, but either way, the report was for an unresponsive person. They called police. When police got there, the girls had, like, called other friends to the scene. So I don't know why that was. It was because they thought, you know, that they were unresponsive. They maybe and they were all, like, 20, 21, so maybe they had alcohol in the house or drugs and they were scared to call the cops. Who knows? We don't know anything like that. But either way, that's how it gets reported. Um, another strange oddity is that one of the girl's dogs was in the home, and it's not a small dog. It's, it's a big, like, golden doodle dog, and it seems really odd that it wouldn't have made any noise throughout this process um, of four people being stabbed to death. Uh, we do know that none of the victims were sexually assaulted. We know that police have said they believe one of the victims was the target and the others were collateral damage. Um, and that might be because they had more defensive wounds on them or, or something like that. How does that had... even mean? Like, that doesn't make sense, though, that they'd be collateral. Because if you go to kill one person, you don't have to kill everyone in the home. Like, right. I mean, I guess I can't, I'm, I'm not even capable of putting myself into the mind of somebody who would do something like this because it doesn't even make sense. It is, that is what is so creepy about this is like, it just doesn't make sense. So a lot of people have been... Um, wondering if perhaps this is a serial killer. I've been watching some profilers within the FBI and other agencies, though, and they've said that this is a really risky crime for someone to carry out if they didn't really know the home and know like what the situation was. You're going into a home with six young adults who any of them could have a gun, have a knife, could call 911, you could be overpowered. Like If you don't really know the layout, don't really know what you're doing, that seems pretty risky. Also, why would also, the dog... Also, the, the, the fact that the dog didn't bark or freak out Maybe I'm overreading this, but it suggests to me that they might have known, been familiar. Like, I know yes. my dogs in my life, it's like they'll bark at a stranger, but if they know the person, they won't bark. Yes, exactly. And so while, like, the randomness of it makes you feel like it would be a serial killer, because who else would do something like this? The actual, like, logistics of the case suggest it was not, and it was somebody that was somewhat known to them. Apparently, it was a big party house. Um, the families have said a lot of people probably had, like, the key code entry to the house because they had people over a lot. Again, they were in Greek life. They were, you know, young people, and, and so uh, that's it's going to be a really difficult crime scene for that reason. That means a lot of people's DNA is in the house. Um, also and you, you also, have... in, in that kind of a setting, you're in a college town, you feel safe. Right. Like yeah. people sometimes don't even lock their doors or they'll just have a casual approach to these things and give out the code because you really do feel safe in places like that because by and large you are. And yet mm -hmm. the idea that something like this would happen kind of shatters that and it it's yeah. really crazy. Yeah, they haven't had a murder in the town, I think I saw for like seven years. So this is very um, much an outlier. It's very scary. The, a couple things we do know, the cops have cleared both of the other roommates from being involved. They've cleared the ex-boyfriend I mentioned. They've said it, has, it was not a murder-suicide, so none of the other, none of the victims were the perpetrators. Um, they have cleared the driver who drove them home that night. They've cleared a man who was seen in the food truck video with them. So they've ruled out some people, but they really have not in any way tipped their hat towards what they know. And, and as a whole, police have looked really incompetent in this process. Um, you know, obviously, just the fact that so many people Shocker. were at the crime scene. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the morning that it was reported like that initially makes it very difficult but like they were they didn't um they let like a whole dumpster get taken away before searching it they did not measure the tire tracks in the driveway until like four or five days later like just some very obvious missteps that you could observe as an outsider watching them conduct this and they have immense resources i think they've been given over a million dollars they have a um lab on on the scene to test more dna more readily um and this kind of crime you know, it's a, it's a false perception that, that crime scenes always have as much DNA as CSI or, you know, law and order would leave you, lead you to believe. They do DNA is actually only present about 10% of cases or less. But in this kind of case where it's a stabbing, 
you are more likely to have more DNA because, um, you know, if you're holding the, this is so graphic, but if you're holding the victim and stabbing, like you could have wounds on the, the perpetrator's hands and, and things of that nature, There's just a lot more blood involved. So um, you would think that they would have a lot more evidence. They have reportedly been getting thousands of tips, um, people turning in like their ring video cameras, just trying to do anything they can to assist. Um, but it, it really does seem like they're muddying it. The cops have given very inconsistent information and statements like they first came out and said the town didn't need to be worried this was a targeted attack other people were safe and then literally 24 hours later they came back out and they're like actually no probably be vigilant oh. like um there was a dog this is so awful but there was a dog that was found skinned in the neighborhood a couple days before this happened and so a lot of people have said like what that, yeah a lot of people have been like that's probably connected you know if you're gonna go you don't just go a, a normal person does not go from being a normal person to stabbing four people to death, right? That is an escalation, and this person has definitely done other stuff in the past, and often serial killers or, or murderers, like, they practice on animals before they escalate to humans. And so it was a little dog. Um, they, they just really didn't handle that piece of evidence very well. Uh, there also was another murder across the border in Oregon, I believe, that had some similarities people were wanting them to look more deeply into. But as a whole, they just they don't seem to have it together. They keep giving conflicting information in their statements. Uh, victims, family members have spoken out against them. One of the fathers, I believe Kaylee's father, has been um, pretty aggravated with them and said, like, he's not getting straight answers. They are not really being forthcoming with them. Uh, one of the victim's sisters has said she's kind of taken matters into her own hands and started looking for information on her own. And, and she was the one that, again, discovered the video, you know, of the food truck, which didn't prove to be anything, but could have, right? There's there's plenty of people right there that could have. think they would have checked that box, okay, yeah, like as part of an yeah. investigation. Yes, exactly. And so as a whole, like, people are just really losing um, a lot of confidence, and I get it. But I think it's important that people understand that you know this is actually pretty typical most violent crimes are committed by somebody who is known to the perpetrator and that's just um because most things are things like domestic violence or like workplace disputes or, or something like that it's, it's pretty rare to just have a random attack but when you do cops are really really bad at solving it i mean they just they don't have the capacity and competencies and tools that many people believe that they do we're, we're still pretty regressive in our ability to actually get in there and solve something like this. And so I'm really hoping this case does not go cold, but the reality is there's actually a big likelihood, even when they have this amount of money and this amount of attention on it, um, just because they really, you know, they don't always have their act together very, very efficiently. And um, so as a result, the University of Idaho is actually letting students go remote. They're not making them come back to the campus, which is good because I would definitely not be... <laughs> heading back there if I were at that school yeah, right now. Yeah, with a potential killer on the loose. No, thank you. Yeah, absolutely not. But yeah, you know, all that, some of it all to say, I think because these were four white victims, um, because it was a knife that was used in the attack, I think that's why you're just simply not seeing the like media circus around this that you've seen around other, you know, bad tragedies. And uh, I hate that for the victims and their families. I hope that they are able to, to get some sort of, you know, I don't think closure is a real thing from my time working around victims. They have always told me, like, that's that's a facade. You can't get closure. But I hope they get some accountability, some answers in this because it's just a really horrific uh, crime. And, and, you know, it's important that we find who, who did it so it doesn't have anybody else. And, and I think that's where yeah. police resources should be going. <laughs> I, I agree with you. And I, I also just wish that as a society and as a media and everything, we were more even-handed in our coverage of tragedies and actually paid things the attention they deserve on the merits rather than on whether or not they'll allow us to push a certain narrative or beat up the other side or that, like which tragedies are useful and which aren't to for the media to cover i think is is a sign of uh societal sickness that, that i hope we can heal from 